so I, um, I've been threatening that I can actually play these guitars that are behind me. Yeah. <laughs> I've been telling people, you know, one of these days I'll I'll take it off of the wall and I'll actually play it while you're, you know, like elevator music as you're coming in to the the meetup. It's like, oh, what's going on? But <laughs> normally what I end up doing is I just share my uh, computer sound and put on YouTube. <laughs> and I say like, oh, yeah, this is what we got. This is me jamming. But I promise, I promise everyone that one day there will be live music as you come in it will happen nice <laughs> promise it i uh, see there's some people jumping in what's going on everybody welcome happy to have you here and excited to be chatting we are going to be getting started in just one second well more like two minutes to let everybody come in get situated and while we are just having a little chat right now, I'm going to drop a link to our Slack community into the chat. In case anyone is not in there, it is where it's all happening right now. If you want to continue any of these conversations that we're having, anything that is interesting to you, we have Joseph and Mike today with us and they are both in the slack so it will be great to continue talking to them we hope to see you there in our data on kubernetes slack channel or slack workspace i think is the key name for it these days now i'll let everybody jump in, give you a few more moments, and then we'll go ahead and get started with Mike and Joseph. All right. This is when you got to break in with that guitar. I know, here's the, here, all right, here we go. Ready? I, I, I've been contemplating what I'm going to play. Oh, let's see if I can put it close enough to the mic. What I wanted to do was plug it in to the actual, I have a sound card and everything set up for this, but can you hear that? Yep. Welcome everybody to our Data on Kubernetes meetup. We are very excited to have Mike and Joseph with you today. They are SREs at Adobe. Maybe I could do the whole intro on the guitar. I was going to say, like, you, I, I feel something here. <laughs> can you, maybe I can sing it. Well, just to let everybody know what we're doing, I want to let you guys know where we're coming from. Mike and Joseph have been messing around with Kubernetes for five years now. Five years. They were at the 1.0, was it? 1.0 release. On that launch release party, yeah, in wow. Oregon at OSCON. 1.0. So, just to give them a little bit of street cred, they know, they've been around the block, they know what they're doing. And now I'm getting to a point where I think my mental power is not going to be able to continue. All right. We can't drain you, we can't drain you. <laughs> I don't know if I can keep, hold the conversation and keep trying to play at the same time, but I may just, you know, keep it in my hand in case we need to break out into song at any moment. I see yes. Rich. Rich is raising his hand in here. Rich, you wanna you wanna jump on and uh, bust out some raps or anything on it? I see him raising his hand. Uh, let us know in the chat. Yeah. So, all right. I think we can get started for real. It looks like we've got a quorum. Let me put my guitar back up on the wall. Uh. Happy to have everyone here with us today. This is a first time with our Data on Kubernetes community meetup. We have two people. It's almost a panel discussion. Today, we're talking with Mike and Joseph from Adobe. As I mentioned earlier, I want to just mention a few more things about these two incredible 
beings that are with us. <laughs> Mike and Joseph, as I said, they have been around since Kubernetes 1.0, and they've been doing all kinds of stuff on Kubernetes. We're going to talk to them today about that. Joseph is actually heading up the 1.20 comms team. He was telling me a little bit about that earlier before we all jumped on. And Mike is a self-proclaimed lazy developer. He has got the itch to automate everything that he can. So we all know that makes him an amazing programmer, I imagine. Uh, now, let's get into the nitty gritty of what we came here to talk about today. We are going to dive into quite a bit, but the main theme is going to be this idea of centralization versus small team autonomy. And I think that I, if I didn't mention it before, these guys are working at Adobe with the advertising cloud. And I want to just quickly, before we get into all this deep stuff, just can you both give us a, an overview of how you got into tech and then maybe how you got into Kubernetes specifically? Sure. So I'll, I'll start. So I've, I've been in tech for almost about 25 years now. So it's an old dog here, you know, started in the, in the more the Windows server side of the world. So I, I, you know, I was on all that Linux battle back and forth trying to, you know, help get it there to show that, hey, it's, it's something that we could use in production and have been in the more the infrastructure space and architecture space, you know, all during that, that period. Um, even at certain points in my career, started up my own little startup where I was providing networks, you know, uh, a network service provider in a data center. So kind of cut my teeth across the board with, you know, differing aspects of it. I think over the last decade is when I really started kind of like when public cloud emerged, probably a little more of a decade, probably 2006 is when I started becoming aware of what was happening with AWS. I think that fundamental shift along with the culture shift in tech is kind of where, you know, I allowed myself to kind of go in regards to like the emergence of DevOps, SRE, you know, the constructs around like really uh, what's, what's best practice? How do you run these things? How do you take a more programmatic point of view when it comes to these things that don't really play as nicely, especially when you're in a data center to be programmatic, you're dealing with all these primitives that are challenging. And for as far as like, you know, Kubernetes, actually what kind of got me here was I was actually very active and still kind of have some parts where we, we run OpenStack in the data centers across like 150,000 cores, did it at previous job as well. But I think the big challenge that really drew me to Kubernetes was, you know, we didn't have developers really like screaming to run on the platform. You know, they were having their challenges with shipping things into these environments. And so we were really like looking at like, how do we kind of solve this? At, at my last job, Lithium, where uh, Mike was with me as well, uh, we really were trying to solve that problem of like, how do we ship something very consistently down the line so that we didn't get the friction? And when Docker came, when we got aware of Docker in 2014, our minds were like, wow, this is maybe the artifact that's going to get us there. But then we ran into that problem with a lot of people, like when we started running at scale, like how do you manage all these Docker containers all over the place? Oh, it was yeah. like the Wild West. And it was a, a new problem that we that appeared that we created of our own doing. And that's when we kind of started looking at Kubernetes and thinking about like, well, what is this tool? What does it do? And we started like really hacking away. And one gentleman on our team, you know, was really like digging deep into it. And that's when we started coming into it and understanding like, hey, this could be the way we could actually just, and we were just looking at microservices. We weren't looking at data. We were looking at databases, leave those things alone. They're difficult as they are. Let's just solve this one problem. And that's kind of what got me into the, the community at that time. That's awesome. How about you, Mike? So my background's uh, within software engineering. I worked at a bunch of different uh, game review websites for a while doing kind of the backend APIs, database interactions, that kind of stuff. Started making the change over to infrastructure when it just, we had the problem solved, a lot of it solved on the API side, the interactions with the DAOs, and it became more of a <clears throat> how to test our infrastructure test our code with an infrastructure that matches production. So it kind of started off with the, the vagrant side of approach of things. Then I started to shift a little more into, okay, well, config management, the chefs, uh, those sort of, you know, chef puppet, that kind of stuff, building up the, the test automation that went with it. And then just kind of the, 
the best way to describe it is, you know, that kind of DevRel developer happiness from the infrastructure side to the engineering teams. Kind of started making a transition to there with Lockie and Joe, learned about Kubernetes, and then I was just on that bandwagon ever yeah. since. It was just like, okay, this is cool. I like it. Got along at Adobe, had a chance to, you know, build and maintain our own stack uh, and just been having a blast with it ever since. And so this is just a little aside, uh, quick question. Did you ever think about any of the other ones? Like, were you ever looking into Docker Swarm or what, did you know yeah. Kubernetes? So briefly looked at Swarm, um, but at the time, so when I was kind of doing an evaluation, it was Swarm, ECS, and Kubernetes. Um, and initially there, it was kind of a, you know, my, my opinion at the time was like, if you want easy management, you know, and this was years and years ago, if you want easy management, it was ECS, you wanted a great developer community, you wanted a great, you know, developer platform, you know, great way to run it, go Kubernetes, even though it's a higher management overhead on the infrastructure. And over the years that has shifted, you know, now it's a lot easier to run Kubernetes without having to have a very high overhead of your infrastructure. Mm. There's still a lot involved on top of it now that makes the platform a rich platform for everybody to use, but the core fundamentals is a much simpler problem than it used to be now that you know, there's a lot of the, the core APIs. In yes, place. for sure. So yeah, I was gonna say, uh, and that's, you know, that's actually one of my, you know, guiding philosophies is give me an API and I'll be happy. Uh, nice. So. I've avoided the data center stuff like Joe has. Um, you know, he, he's my data center go-to guy, but uh, he gives me an API and then I become nice. happy. What were you gonna mention, Joseph? Yeah, I was gonna say along the bike, I mean, we, we did do an exhaustive look at like a lot of the schedulers, cause you gotta think this is like 2014, you know, we, yeah. there was a lot of people trying to solve the problem. Um, you know, there was an early microservices summit. You could probably go online and it's actually was a pretty monumental event. This is pre KubeCon and all these things. Um, Adrian Cockcroft was there. Yelp guys were showing us what they were doing with like, you know, they were doing like Mesos uh, and they kind yeah. of built like this little bespoke pipeline. Yeah. We're seeing everybody do all these different type of techniques. I, I reach out, try to connect with the Mesosphere. I had a, it was really, community sometimes makes a big difference in regards to like, uh -huh. whether you embrace something or not. And I definitely kind of got that like, hey, if, if you don't have, if you have to ask the price tag, you probably can't afford us kind of like, that's the vibe oh, I kind of got yeah. where I was like, all right, I'm gonna go look at this other thing. And then I had a lot of friction and here's another, you know, this is when VCs kind of get into these things because sometimes we do diligence for these guys. Um, I had a VC really who was an investor in our company was really pressuring us to not use Kubernetes and to use Swarm. And we had to really go really exhaustive about like the technical challenges with it. Uh, even where I was getting a lot of pressure from my boss and his boss to use this because obviously we're all invested in you. We want to see these use cases. And we're like, look, this does not work for these reasons. Thought I was going to get fired, but I was able to really prove it out. But yeah, I almost got fired for Kubernetes and jumping on early. So, you know, definitely <laughs> it was a, a challenging point. Oh, that's awesome, Ben. And good on you for sticking to your guns. That's really cool to see. And you knew, you, I imagine you knew that, hey, this is, this is the one. It's just making life easier. And well, in a way, it's, it's, you saw the potential for it. Uh, yeah, it was definitely a potential. I would say, yeah, I, in hindsight, now I'm like, easier. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what were they thinking in hindsight? Like, if I talked to the guy five years ago, I'd be like, you're crazy, don't do this. <laughs> yeah, well, awesome. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> it's a different world these days. <laughs> yep, yeah, so let's jump into what you all are doing at Adobe. And I think before we can get into the, the like theme of this this chat, I wanted to break down how your stack looks. And I know Mike, you mentioned you have some slides to really like illustrate the points. Can you share your screen and show us what you guys are working with? Yeah, I can do that. Cool. All right. While you're searching for it, I'll bust out the guitar again. Beware. <laughs> uh, oh, darn it, my privacy, hold on a second here. No worries. In the, in the interim, uh, I know there's um, like, there's some, stats that you gave me and joseph yeah. maybe while while mike's looking for this can you just give us an overview of oh here he goes sorry you will see you here from. okay cool there so, it is where's the nice presentation view of it um hopefully everybody can see that okay so the adobe advertising cloud it's a low latency high traffic big data um kind of workflow 
So as you can see, you know, our 95th percentile of requests have to be under 50 milliseconds. Uh, that's challenging on a bare metal VM and Kubernetes perspective. So we got a lot of different uh, challenges that we have to code for within that. So <clears throat> some stats about our stack. Uh, right now we're running about 500, give or take. We do a lot of auto scaling. So that, that number varies. Maybe it's down to 450 today. Maybe it's up to 600 tomorrow. Um, but our base is around 500, and we expect that to grow to around 800 by the end of the year. Uh, 7,500 pods, um, that's spread out across the different clusters. Um, some of them, you know, some apps run 20, 30 pods, some apps run one or two. So the number of deployment stateful sets really kind of all over the place. Um, one of the interesting things that we do is because of the types of workloads and trying to get the bin packing in there and the the most efficient at series as possible, we run the five series in Amazon. And when I say five series, that's because we may run some C5, some M5, some R5s um, of varying types, 4XLs, 8XLs, 12XLs, 9XLs, <clears throat> because it basically we have 30, 40 some odd auto scaling groups. So the Kubernetes auto scaler and schedule can pick the best machine for that workload. So that it, you know, if it's a higher CPU, you'll end up on a C series. Higher memory, you'll end up on an R series. <clears throat> and we get better bin packing and better cluster utilization um, by enabling us to do that. Um, we bake, we do core images or golden images for the Kubernetes infrastructure itself. So things like the Kubelet configuration, API server, Docker configs, that kind of stuff. Those are all done by golden images. So we bake a new image using Packer and we roll it out um, to the auto scaling groups and then we cycle the nodes onto that new image. But the components and services that run on top, things like the cluster auto scaler, cert manager, Prometheus, Argo, a whole bunch of tools that we use, uh, those are all deployed continuously just as needed. We make an update, we upgrade a version, gets pushed out by a GitOps pipeline within a few minutes from being merged within master. So that's kind of a stats overview of our cluster. More architecturally, uh, this is kind of a very basic diagram I pulled from a much rich, you know, much bigger diagram with a lot of the Adobe specific stuff. But we basically run three auto scaling groups across, each, you know, one per AZ for the masters. That way, there um, we never end up in a situation where all three of the masters are in the same availability zone. They're always spread out. Um, if we lose an availability zone for some reason, we've only lost one master, not all three masters. Just a heads up, I'm, I'm not sure if we're seeing the slides going forward. Oh no. Yeah, I, 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 uh, we're, we're on the original slide. Oops, okay, bring, let's see here. Uh, where's my PowerPoint? Oops. Are you seeing the? Yeah, no, now we got it. Okay, so can, just so people can take a screenshot if they wanted to. Cool. Can you make it Here's, a little bigger, or could you maximize that? Yeah. Is that better? Awesome. Perfect. All right. So you heard me describe all this stuff. You can quickly scan any additional things, but kind of went over all of that. A more interesting diagram is this one, which has the different auto scaling groups for the different workers. Um, as I had mentioned, we have 30, 40 some odd auto scaling groups. Um, and that's because we have different pools of workers. We have um, dedicated on demand workers. We have spot instances. We have pools that are dedicated just to a specific application. And again, we split these up per AZ. So, <clears throat> Um, we'll run for every pool of workers, we run three auto scaling groups for it. So each of the M5D8XLs, there's three auto scaling groups. Well, not just three, but there's six because we run on demand and we run spot of the M5D8XLs. And then perhaps, you know, at our bidding application runs on M5D12XLs perhaps. And so we'll have a custom pool of those. And so there's a lot of auto scaling groups um, but they're all managed in the same way. So to us, it's basically 
there's an auto scaling group within Kubernetes, and we only think about it from the perspective of one auto scaling group, even if the minutia of it is that there's 30 or 40. It makes it a lot easier for us to manage if we treat them all kind of the same. Well, uh, yeah, that's a great way. Um, <clears throat> so it's, you know, we talked to people before <laughs> about the multiple auto scaling groups, um, and it, it implies that there's a lot of management overhead, um, but if they're kind of cookie cutter, how they get deployed and you're just dealing with, you know, your labels and your taints um, on it, the applications, you know, tolerate and use node affinity to get to the appropriate thing that they want. It puts a little bit more of the thought onto the application than mm -hmm. onto the infrastructure, um, but it gives that application a lot of flexibility and a lot of durability for where and how to schedule their workloads. And then we have different load balancers for different purposes. We have you know, an internal one, which allows access from like the corp network, that'd be where things like Prometheus and stuff are accessible um, for their UI and or for people to run queries. You have VPC network based ones that for things outside the Kubernetes cluster to go through ingress over private IPs into that. And then we have the actual public load balancers where our public traffic gets ingressed um, from the internet. And each of these are ingress classes um, or what will become an ingress class. Right now, they're just the ingress annotation. Uh, we haven't upgraded to 1.19 yet. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe, you know, we got to get on that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got to run what you uh, help release. Yeah. Uh, but, but anyway, um, that's kind of the, the stack setup. That's awesome. Thanks for giving us a little bit more color around that. I'm wondering, what are some tools that you feel like are must-haves and you really enjoy? They make your life easier. They're, they're something that you think, wow, I, I couldn't live without this. Oh, I just tweeted about this the other day. Um, there was that thread going around of what are your top three tools for running the cluster. Um, I think that there's two views into it. There's what are the top tools for running a cluster? And what are the top tools for using a cluster? And I think those are different things. Um, for using a cluster, you start talking about important tools like Helm, Customize, things like that. You start thinking about Argo. You start thinking about Kubeflow and that kind of stuff. When you're talking about from a system perspective, important things are like, you know, Prometheus operator to allow teams to run their own Prometheus perhaps or to do your own monitoring of it. You got Cubed IAM and AWS so that you get you know, those short-lived AWS credentials, much like an instance profile. So security is good there, your cluster autoscaler. Um, so I, I think there's two views to it. Joe, I know you got some views of the types of things. I know, I, I, always, I always give you this where I'm like, no, no love for open policy agent. I, I just <laughs> found it, it gives us such use out of it. You know, it helps put up these nice guardrails at times and keeps us compliant, you know, helps our, you know, engineers. So. You know, I got to give a shout out to uh, Open Policy Agent. Oh, definitely. We have some interesting rules within there to help with ingresses, to help with basically setting some sane defaults for people so they don't have to think about, you know, I'm using an ALB ingress controller. I don't need to think about what security groups to put onto my ALB. It's mm -hmm. just the OPA handles that as it comes in. If you've already set them, it'll use those. But if you don't, that stuff gets set. So we use OPA quite a bit. Nice. I would say, you know, on my radar now, though, like things that are really starting to interest me more is a lot of times the problems that come to us are like the needle in the haystack, haystack type stuff. So mm -hmm. for me, like what, what I'm starting to look on the horizon is because, you know, we're starting to use or see BPF become more a thing for us. Mm -hmm. So you'll see companies like, you know, like Kimball that have things like Inspector Gadget, where I'm like, this is kind of interesting, where it's kind of like helps you kind of get in there and dig in and because and, we're just got the scale with so few people that like you just want to be able to really provide those insights and then extend it out. So devs can also have those, those type of, you know, insights into their stack or find that when that smoke is starting to come up, you know, in these environments. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that's great. Well, I appreciate that. I'm sure uh, a lot of people out there are in the same boat, or if you have used any of these tools that they're talking about, let us know in the chat because this is some very cool stuff. I love hearing about that. And especially when you're running such scale, it's great to know like what are some tools that are really helping you and making your lives easier. Now let's, uh, let's jump into the topic that we 
came here to talk about is centralization versus small team autonomy. And I wanted to just kind of quote this key takeaway and see what your opinions were about the idea of loosely coupled teams and loosely coupled workloads, loosely coupled data on a build for everyone platform. So can you give us your thoughts on that, Joe, maybe? You know, I, I think, you know, that has, uh, especially here at Adobe, since, you know, we also have like, you know, a, a larger group. And when we got acquired, and this is kind of like three and a half years ago, four years ago, roughly, you know, we were really a small company, you know, so we were building a platform for, and we were helping our developers with virtualization platforms, you know, in our infrastructure. And we're just starting to make that container journey here at that, that company. Now fast, like go to the Adobe, we get acquired. Uh, one of the first things I was told is like, hey, we, they have the container solutions all solved. Stop your dev as you get acquired. You know, you guys don't need to do this anymore. You're going to love what we have. Well, the, the challenge was, is what we had requirement wise for how we were building, deploying and shipping applications. And in a sense, organizationally was kind of different than the bigger enterprise, you know, the larger company approach. And even some of the you know, architecture that they chose was challenging. They were using Mesos. You know, we were already kind of going down the Kubernetes path. So that platform was very, very rigid and very like, it, it had a certain kind of like design that wasn't very extensible for us. And we were kind of running very small, lean, and it, our platform and our choices and decision-making was very reflective of it, even from just the day-to-day. -day. Like I, I kind of coined this way I phrase like my team and how they work where we're, we're kind of full stack SRE. And when I mean that, I don't mean, you know, like just in the technical sense, but I also mean like, I expect my individ individuals on my team or my org to, you know, be DevRel internally, be the evangelist, to be able to really, you know, help engineers maximize what we're doing on there. And I want to be able to be able to quickly and run very lean so that they can be able to bring back any challenges or friction or impedance points with the, you know, the platform that we're running and be able to just kind of rinse and repeat. And anytime I've ever run into challenges with like where we're going as a team, I always kind of fall back to, you know, this axiom of just kind of like, uh, you know, hey, let's, let's, let's keep it very basic and simple. And that's reflected in our designs. You know, we keep things very, oh, do, do we need it? Yes, no, like what problem is it solving? Keep the architectures very lean and simple so that we don't have too much complexity going on and that we really are just bringing back value in regards to how we're shipping, you know, are things, you know, you know, we look at like the developer, like what they're spending their time on, you know, and like try to look back at that and say, are they more efficient? Are they able to ship? Are they able to really, you know, keep the availability and resilience up high with the platforms that we're using? And so for us, that leanness really helped us to be able to, to, to really be and meet where the developers are at and kind of solve that, that problem. And so I think that's kind of where I, I, I at one point I definitely was, hey, this is the way we need to be. And we, and we for a reason, kept running this platform even after acquisition. But that's kind of changed now for us as the broader organization has caught up. They've kind of got into their 2.0 version of this bespoke yeah. container platform that's running. I started really telling the team, like, look, at some point, like, it's kind of like, you know, like right now we have the Tour de France going on. You have those breakaway, you know, racers that are out front. Yeah. And then you have the Peloton. Eventually the Peloton will catch up. And so I look at it kind of the same way. And so immediately when I start to see it, I'm like, we need to start contributing back internally. Let's bring back what we're learning, especially the use cases on the application plane. Let's bring those back into that platform so that we can join together and help kind of align. So, you know, I don't definitely want to keep running a platform to run it. I definitely want to make sure that, hey, if I can, if I can get economies of scale with other engineers internally, that's always my default, you know? So that's kind of what's happened to us at Adobe. So in a sense, I think the organization started to evolve and became a little bit more modular in their thinking and design with their platform to where I was like, hey, I think we can kind of work with this team and kind of overlay what we're doing and actually get this platform and get us out of the control plane business. Because believe me, we, we don't love running a control plane. I love like getting on the application side of it and solving uh -huh. those problems. Let's let another team go down there and take, over, take that over so that we can focus on you know, other interesting problems that are facing our developers. And along those lines, do you feel like it was part of your team that contributed to like the Peloton catching up per se, or the direction that 
the the larger company went in? I you know I probably wouldn't take credit for that. I mean, we've definitely like had a lot of like talks. I think Mike probably spent the most time actually you know engaging, and anytime those opportunities contribute back, you know, we were. Uh, it was interesting. I think the organization also, once they kind of got on the Kubernetes train and cloud native really became a thing, I started to notice an evolution. And it was also, I think, more than just the tooling. It was the culture around it, meaning like they also needed to evolve in regards to, you know, like what DevOps was and what it meant to the organization and site reliability engineering. And I think a lot of like larger organizations kind of face that same journey where it's like, you know, it, it, you can't just rebrand a certain type of role and say, now you're SRE. Like there's a lot yeah. of process and things that you have to learn. I, I went through the same thing. I come from an infrastructure centric background and I had to kind of figure these things out as well. Um, so I think that's kind of what happened. They changed culturally, I think, and all this, and they really got really good individuals who were shipping product. And I think that's the biggest thing is that product centric mentality. And they had an individual who, you know, like was already there and giving them direction and I think he was really key in it, but then you just saw that evolution start to happen. And, you know, definitely we're a smaller team, you know, and it's sometimes hard to be able to fully collaborate, but every time we had opportunity, we're bringing these things back. We're, we stay very active in the Kubernetes community itself, and we're always trying to bring a lot of learnings back and sharing And Sometimes even in areas where maybe we're not using those specific kind of like tools, or maybe these use cases are slightly different, but we still were trying to be available and contribute to that platform in a certain, and whether it was through small contributions, I think Mike did some things that were related to like open policy agent. There's some other things that we are doing that we want to bring to them as well um, in regards to what we're doing with our platform. But then they also have a lot of things that we're like, hey, there's some good stuff here that we could actually leverage as well. Mm. You know, they're, they've embraced kind of like a, a network control plane um, that Cilium, which you know, is in that BPF realm. And I'm like, oh, this is kind of good because right now we've been running, you know, something slightly different and didn't have that ability to really exploit that part of the platform. So I think it's definitely from both sides of it, it it's a good alignment. And I think the one area where I think we do bring value is running at scale is different than when you just build a platform and you just got like a few people that are just kind of getting there, they're building up their architectures. And then all of a sudden you start to bring in like these large workloads then you start to really see like, okay, did we make the right decisions in our architectures? How do we fix these things? How do we adapt, evolve them? I think that's where um, a lot of our opinion helps. And they also have some other individuals who came from outside of Adobe that are also bringing the same kind of like, you know, opinion and, and experience. Um, you know, one, one individual came from Jenkins, Carlos Sanchez. If you haven't seen his talks, he talks about progressive delivery and it's like, you get a lot of these type of users and then all of a sudden like these centralized platforms start to get a lot more reflective and let the organization evolve and, and really be able to kind of then get the benefits of cloud native versus that journey in the past. Like we all know how initially like when cloud evolved, there was a lot of lifting shifting and we had to go through this cycle of like, well, you just don't lift and shift. You need to evolve this thing. So then we saw config manager arise. We saw all these things to really get more cloudy. And I think the same thing is happening, you know, for us organizationally is we started to really evolve and move beyond like, okay, we could put it into a container. Now it's running in a container. Then it's like, well, I want this to run really efficiently. Like I want to make sure this is resilient. I want to make sure that I can just, you know, from a developer perspective, I can just ship something and I can just go and I can focus on just getting my job done versus like all the friction of like, trying to get a container running, all, all the other little bits you got to do, like, oh, now I need logs, now I need monitoring. It's like, get that out of the way, you know, and don't make cube control like the experience. Make it something that is very reflective that they can just kind of like just go and get the benefits of it. And if they want to dig in, they can. But if they just want to like just ship their, their container, they can do it. Super insightful. That's a good point that Joe brings up there and really reflective of that organizational and philosophy change that Adobe did, it used to be just containers as a platform. And now they have containers as a platform running on Kubernetes and Kubernetes as a platform that's more bare bones Kubernetes. So you can get into the quick and easy, dirty, I got an app, here's a quick config, kind of the Heroku style, boom, I'm running some containers on Kubernetes. And then they have, um, you know, you have access to the control, you know, to the API server. So you can bring your own pipeline if you don't like Adobe's default pipeline, or you can come with no pipeline and just, you know, 
go to that bare bones cube TTL get pods sort of experience. So it really now supports the <clears throat> basic user case. Hey, this is a good way to do it. Kind of following the Adobe standard, all the way up to the power users are like, I want to try something new within Kubernetes that doesn't fit into this pipeline. I can't change it for everybody just to do my proof of concept, but I now have that lower level access that I can do my proof of concept to get it and then bring it back to that 90%. That's awesome. Cause I was just going to jump in and ask about like, do you, do you all ever feel like a skunk works team where you're, you're doing these testings with some really cutting edge stuff and how that happens. But I guess that's, that's what you were talking about, right, Mike? That you're saying you have this this access, so people who really are these power users, they can play around with whatever it is that is interesting in the moment, but it's not going to force everyone to adopt that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, one of the, the powerful aspects of Kubernetes is that you can easily have things that are, you know, on that, that spectrum on both ends. Um, as you go on your Kubernetes journey, you know, when you first start out, you may not have a pipeline that goes to it. And I, you know, Joe and I have talked about this a lot. Unless you have some sort of pipeline that gets you from code to production in a Kubernetes cloud native manner, you bring on a lot of challenges and complexities and risks that are not there if you have some sort of pipeline for people to get there. But your initial pipeline generally are going to be pretty basic. I take some stuff, Docker build it you know, here's a YAML file, I template it, push it, boom, I'm done, right? Until you get to the, okay, well, it runs tests first. Oh, it runs integration tests first. So, okay, now, it, you know, get opsy sort of thing, and then this and that and the next thing. Um, and then you have that much more robust platform that 90%, the 99% of your users can use. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, you know, as you test those new features, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, an addition, a different way of doing rolling updates, to your thing, or maybe you want to bring in an operator and try an operator pattern for something, you have that flexibility to do it. So now let's talk for a minute about this idea of if it's run by the platform team, is it inevitably a pet? Or is it just more of a pet? <laughs> That's a conversation we have quite often as well. <laughs> um, you know, I don't Personally, philosophically, I don't think clusters should be pets. Um, but at the same time, I think with a infrastructure platform, it's hard for people not to look at them like a pet. Um, and you know, I think it, you know, it, it turns into more of a. Um, I have a herd of horses that are thoroughbreds. I have a herd of horses that are you know, quarter mile horses, I have a, you know, stable of horses that are just my studs. And so you still, even though they may be, you know, more, they're, they're not fixed, it's not that one horse you like, um, you still like the way in which things are and that are there. And sometimes it is hard to build a deployment pipeline that says, oh, I've been deploying here, all of a sudden now I'm gonna cut over to here. That may be a simple thing to change where the, the pipeline points and where things launch, but it's the ingress into both clusters now all of a sudden that's a lot more complicated of a challenge to solve. You know, if you're pointing all your users to cluster A, how do you go about pointing them to cluster B when those things go, when both are there, especially if you're running stateful workloads because, you know, where's your primary, um, you know, where's the primary data live? Totally. And Along these lines of you talking about how you have it set up and architected on, okay, well, if you want to go in and um, and play with something and you know test out the newest whatever, you can. But where does the line? Where is there this line that gets drawn on? Hey, is this the is this the main platform or is this the individual teams kind of skunk works? I'm sorry, give me that again. I'm, I was looking at the chat question. No worries. Yeah, it was, uh, it's mainly around how can you tell what is the main platform, where, and when do you, there's these like skunk works, whatever that's getting integrated in. When does those actually get integrated in or 
when does the individual team take ownership and integrate it into the main platform that you're dealing with? Yeah, you know, that's, uh, I mean, I, you know, and especially, and I think Mike didn't kind of like talk, didn't mention it earlier, but, you know, we're, we're split across quite a, like a few platforms. So we still have quite a bit of big data center footprint and it has primarily VMs with some Kubernetes as well. And the long-term goal is like, all right, we, we've kind of done this journey of, hey, AWS costs too much. Let's get to the data, back, bring these workloads back to data center. And then all of a sudden now we're back to actually moving some things back for a strategic reason. Um, and so here we have this underlying infrastructure that is kind of in like this, this transition. And then we also have this other larger, broader infrastructure platform that now has a lot of good value add that, you know, we're like, hey, you know what, we really should align and kind of move a lot of these things there. And so then now the question comes up is, okay, all the tenants that are all spread across all these areas, like they're all in these different islands and we're having to manage like a lot of the communications to these things. And so, and especially when we have like a use case where proximity is critical for one part of our, of our kind of like bidding part of the platform, yeah, you know, we, we have to kind of think about that. And that's kind of one of the big things that we were just recently just addressing uh, in a recent meeting where we were just chatting like, hey, we could take this large piece that's getting ready to go to Kubernetes and put it on our platform. And I'm like, but then we're going to have to migrate it again, you know? So we're, we're going through all that challenges of like, Hey, let's not even, let's not even do that. Cause we know it'll happen. It will just sit there and no one's going to want to move it. <laughs> and you know, there's one thing about like GitOps is very interesting. And that's, you know, one thing that we kind of like use in our infrastructure is it's, it's good for, recreating objects and for a lot of the really lighter things but that data gravity underneath a lot of times dictates like how and where we go and that seems no matter what no matter what abstraction we put on top wherever that is at that tends to be like where you kind of get locked in at or mm -hmm. you shift and kind of move in my ideal world though we're, we're kind of at an inflection point where I, it, i'm really trying to simplify and kind of like really start to consolidate these things and so that's where like this first foray into starting to align ourselves with that broader infrastructure platform because it hits all our key requirements that we need, not only to, to ship and run, but to run our product, to give us that innovative platform that we can contribute to. So, you know, we're, we're kind of at that point where my team is stretched so thin because we have to cover so much like infrastructure surface coverage. So yeah. from, from that, that persona, I'm like, I need to bring this back down. Like there's just way too much risk for us to manage. Like we can't keep running like this. Then there's the other persona of our developers where they're like, oh great, you're gonna, you're gonna impose on us another yeah. migration. But I'm like, I know, hey, we, well, we didn't expect to get acquired, happened. Um, you know, and then we didn't expect to kind of move so far so fast with Kubernetes. That's a good thing. Um, now we got to figure out like, how do we start to do it? But Fortunately, like we have kind of that different parts of the stack are very unique to themselves. They don't need that tightly coupling. They can actually kind of live, you know, in, in these different spaces. And now it's more a matter of like, okay, how do we herd these things? And what I mean herd, it's not just the actual infrastructure. I'm talking about just some of these things. We, we realize that they're not a great fit for Kubernetes. And there also may be business decisions why they may not go as well. And so what I'm trying to say is like, we're going to be in a hybrid world for a little bit with not only just these varying platforms that we're starting to kind of like consolidate and kind of simplify, but that we still are going to live in a world where we're like, we have one foot in like an EC2, a VM world. And then we have another foot that's in a container world. And so then how do we design architectures and how do we, how do we make sure that we don't impose or introduce collect complexity or introduce more latency or just introduce more more problems that will plague us because now we we've introduced this challenge of developers having to navigate both sides of the world. It's like, oh, I got to go here for a dashboard. I got to go here for a dashboard. Yeah. So I think for us, that's what we're trying to do is like start to slowly like simplify and move these things in areas where they need to make sense. And so it's still it's still like kind of like an ongoing thing that I'm working on from a roadmap perspective. And I think we kind of have a good idea of where we're where we're landing at. But for the foreseeable future, we're, we're kind of living in this world of just, you know, a few multiple platforms. And hopefully in a year, you know, when you talk to me, there may be just two if everything goes really yeah. well. And 
you know, like I said, fortunately, because they're loosely coupled, we're able to kind of have that flexibility. Nice. Well, there's a there's a question in the chat that I think Mike, you you can give a stab at it, but I'm I'm gonna read it for everybody that's listening later on in the future. They're asking, Dean is asking, you have a single product advertising cloud on a single infrastructure platform, AWS, is the only reason why you are using Kubernetes for the pipeline aspects? So I think, you know, what Joe was talking about kind of leads into some of this. Uh, even though we're doing a migration between platforms within Kubernetes, we're still dealing with that single API interface of Kubernetes. Um, your applications come in through an ingress. Uh, you talk to other things with inside the cluster through a service or service discovery. And so because there's this, uniform, you know, it, running an OpenStack VM versus an AWS VM, they are similar, um, but they are also very different, especially from trying to build, how do I build up these VMs? How do I do these things? And so we're abstracting that out. So that's given us you know, a lot of increased developer velocity. We're having quicker deployment and rollback cycles because you can spin up a whole new integration testing environment in an isolated manner very quickly within Kubernetes by just simply creating a namespace and deploying everything there. Whereas if you're doing it in VMs, you got to spin up new VM infrastructure, you got to spin up new load balancers, you got to spin up, okay, new DNS entries, all of those sort of things. And so <clears throat> by bringing all that stuff into a Kubernetes world, we get that increased velocity. We get to do performance testing in isolated environments. We get to do integration testing in isolated environments. And it brings a much more, a lot more stability to our stack and to our release pipe and then back to the pipeline it means that if we can do these things ahead of time before going to production, when we go through the pipeline, we have a much higher um, higher confidence in the product that we're delivering. I think the other the other thing to think about is just like, I always look at it as like, you, you never let a migration go to waste. And so for me as well, like, and I think this is kind of one of the things where we're thinking about as well, where it's like, don't just lift and shift, make it better, like make it more resilient. And so some of the things that, we are moving in there like it's it's a chance for us to kind of revisit some of these like architectural elements to go back and be like okay we were in a first version of this architecture but now we are you're coming into containers let's leverage the cloud native properties to make this you know a, a lot you know less like people need it to be hands-on to run this infrastructure or a, and a lot better automation like it's there's learnings that definitely have come from us running it in the VM and as we're bringing it into containers and we know the Kubernetes kind of like constructs, we're like, all right, let's go back and like, let's let's fix these elements of it when we bring it in there. So not only do we get a platform that allows us to, you know, ship easier, get better testing and all these things, but we're also doing kind of like a, you know, a re, you know, like revisiting some of these, these architectures and, you know, ideally sometimes refactoring some of these things to behave in that cloud native space. Yeah, and, and not just, not just from the application perspective as well, but also from the infrastructure perspective. I mean, it's, it's one thing on VMs to run auto scaling groups and be able to handle your applications like that, but our entire infrastructure on Kubernetes follows a lot more of those cloud native philosophies that when things don't work, we evict the workload somewhere else and we just kill the nodes. We just, we don't even think about it. You know, when, when things go wrong, it just self heals by taking advantage of the cloud native things um, health checks, auto scaling groups, uh, dynamic workloads, and we just <clears throat> basically if something's going wrong. We kill the node and we move on. We don't even think about it, and it, it makes it really easy. From you know, as Joe's mentioned, we're a very lean team. We get maybe an alert or two a week dealing with the cluster, and every other week, one or two of those alerts are false positives, um, and so it's you know, using cloud native patterns on the infrastructure and on the applications, you sleep better at night. You don't have to worry as much about what you have, but if you lift and shift a bare metal system into a cloud native system without making those adjustments, you're not really solving the problem at hand. You're just running it on a different platform. I love, I love that. And Thank you guys for talking uh, to this these points because along this line, like I'm really fascinated by the idea of what is what are some of the use cases that you're not going to Kubernetes for? Like you you've mapped out what some of these like really great use cases and why obviously it's 
the way you set it up is very helpful, but you know, it sounds like you're still using VMs. What are those? Why do you need to stay with those in that case? Well, just coming from my, my side of it, there's, there's probably, obviously there's a business side of it. Like certain things have life cycles. So just take the technical, take it out of it. Like some of them would just run, you know, better. Like some of the architectures we see sometimes where maybe there's long warm up times and they need to be revisited. And then, you know, I'm balancing it out with, from a business side of it as well. Like, are, you know, is this going to be a feature? Like what, what is, a, what is this, what does this look like in the future? Like talking to product teams, um, there may also be some challenges in regards to, and this is a thing that's become more and more for in the SRE world is just like, you know, like the service level objectives, like, you know, we're looking at them and just like, okay, we have these challenging kind of like requirements for latency and response times where it initially we can't get that same performance because of so much intercommunication that's happening within pods. So we're like, you know what, for now, until we really decide that we want to invest on re-architecting this, this specific application, it's more of like a, a homegrown app, but it's, its requirements make it challenging for us to kind of bring it in there. Like, we're just like, look, it's, it's rocking it in a VM. Like, it's getting the throughput it needs. It's getting that really high, high throughput, low latency, and proximity is really critical where it, it doesn't do as well in Kubernetes. Like, it doesn't mean we, we won't revisit it down the line, but that's kind of been some of the the drivers for us so we've got about seven minutes left i appreciate everybody that's throwing questions into the chat this is awesome please feel free to ask uh, one last question if you have one i want to know since we are doing the data on kubernetes meetup i'd love to hear like what some of your biggest pains are right now around this idea of data on kubernetes and it can be anything from you know the low level piping or it can be from the high level i see mike was mentioning you know some ml stuff what are some pains that you're going through and you were you you would love to have fixed so one of uh, an interesting use case that we came into is you talk about data and kind of stateful workloads and you know dynamic um you know stateless workloads is sometimes your um what you consider a stateless workload on a VM is actually a stateful workload inside of Kubernetes. Um, because maybe you're doing some local caching of data, maybe you're doing some in-memory mappings. Um, those sort of things in a containerized world go away a lot faster than they would in a VM. A VM sticks around for a while, you deploy your new app on top of the existing infrastructure. Within Kubernetes, you deploy a new version of your app, you got a whole new set of pods. And so for some of our applications, um, especially our bidding platform, that's a, that's a shift in the way of thinking about things. Um, the other challenges we've run into with another challenge we ran into is dealing with quorum. Uh, we had applications that uh, <clears throat> while it didn't have necessarily need a quorum sort of system, there was an element of quorum built into it where things were long lived. You know, you had data processor 01, 02, 03, 04 before, and the alerting pipeline, not just for your application, but down the chain for what type of data comes in, made these assumptions that you're always going to have a data 01. And that's not always the case inside of <clears throat> Kubernetes. You can use staple sets to keep those same things, but data 01 isn't always gonna be up because of the way that the data, you know, the transformations of auto scaling perhaps come into play and the we ran into not just the application team alerting would fire, but the team that consumed them would fire and the team below them would fire. And Oops. so all of a sudden, you know, when a pod got rescheduled, four teams would get alerted because data 01 wasn't there anymore. Um, and so it's a, it's a rethink of not just how you store your data and use your data, but how you monitor that that data is, is valid and there. Um, I'd also, you know, suggest some caution with auto scaling and staple workloads. Um, I know we're almost out of time here, but <clears throat> you know, you may want to consider pools of workers for some of your staple data that don't auto scale. So you don't have that volatility in the platform that they run it. Doesn't mean that it's not there or not. There's a tweet that I really like uh, from you know a while back, but basically it's saying, oh, I lost it. Um, 
<clears throat> now here it is. Kubernetes pods are mortal. They born, and when they die, they're not res resurrected. Um, that's from Gabriella NSF on Twitter. Um, but it's a it's an, a different way of looking at stateful workloads because even though your application has state, that doesn't mean long live, and that's a philosophical change with things that are there. You know, you have a database, you think of that database always being there and always up unless something catastrophic has happened. Inside of Kubernetes, that philosophy doesn't hold true. It may be longer lived, but you don't have that guarantee of longer lived um, like you have with an FDM. That's brilliant. Joseph, last word on any pains that you're feeling? You know, I would say, I don't know if it's, you know, it's pains. I mean, it's, if anything, you know, like, especially in, like in the stateful side of things, like what, I, what I've loved is just really the evolution of really container storage and what, you know, where it was at a few years ago versus now. And I think that was the real challenges for me to really jump in and embrace was just, we had certain requirements that made it difficult. And then as well as like, just watching the evolution of how now you're seeing it get become, because you saw a lot of companies was just like, you know, they were a storage company like, oh, we need to have a Kubernetes story, but they didn't really work in the Kubernetes way. But then you saw a few companies out there that really started to kind of like embrace that and to make it really easy to leverage it and then give it the performance that we need. So for me, if anything, it was more a matter of just that's we we had the use cases and now we're seeing that the that that part of the Kubernetes platform has become a thing to where like now we can actually like hey let's we can actually get more efficient and we just had a recent incident where someone kind of like built a homegrown tool that I was like you know what if we would have used container storage we would have solved that problem and so I'm glad that I can actually now bring that forward and really share and you know that's an area where even at Adobe and this broader platform I'm talking about. I've been really trying to like talk about, hey, you know what? This is a thing. We need to have this type of feature in our platform. So if anything, it's more a matter of like, I feel like 2020 is like the year of storage in Kubernetes and get those workloads out there and start to really like embrace it. So I'm excited about, you know, when we get a chance to kind of prove out a few of these things this year. Nice. Oh yeah, that actually reminds me of a really important thing if you can take, you know, one more quick anecdote here. Yeah, go for it. Is um, when you're dealing with stateful workloads, the first thought is I can back it by a PVC and back it by an EBS volume. That provides you some data storage retention, but that means that your pods are limited to where they they run because in a lot of cloud providers, those PVCs are, you know, zone specific. And so you need to look into also cloud native storage solutions that allow you to, you know, do cross spanning of zones for your data. Perfect. Well, it looks like that's all of the time we've got for today. I really appreciate this, guys. This has been super insightful. I've learned a ton. I know everybody else has. The chat's been blowing up, so I know it's it's been educational. For anyone that is not in our Slack community, feel free to jump in it. I just threw it in the chat, and you can continue the conversation with these two as you feel fit. Thank you all for joining us and Thanks. thank you for the wisdom. I appreciate it. We will see you next week on Tuesday, same time, same place. Thank you for having Cheers. us. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys.